all chose to come and worship with us. Uh, we also like to extend a special welcome to any of you folks out there that are watching and joining us online this morning live. We're glad you're with us as well. Uh, wherever we, where you are, we would love to invite you to stand with us wherever you're at and sing along and worship with us as we get started this morning. If it wasn't for 
Well, hey, good morning. Uh, welcome to Northridge. That song is why we are here. There is freedom because of Jesus, because he went to the cross and stood in our place. And so that's why we gather together this morning to lift up his name, to worship him, and learn more about what it means to live out this life that Christ has made possible for us. One of our values that we like to talk about um, here at Northridge is the value of connecting together. And that's something that's been extremely difficult over the past year. And it's something we really want to see our church take next, step, next steps towards together. And uh, that could be as simple as actually filling out this connect card to take a next step just to say, hey, this is who I am. This is where I'm at in life. There's a place on the back to write down a prayer request where um, the leadership of the church can, can begin praying for you, can walk with you for whatever's going on in your life. So I'd encourage you to do that. You can drop it in the offering box on the back wall in the hallway. Um, just encourage you to do that. Also, an awesome way to connect together outside of this time is in community groups. And so we have different community groups that meet at different times throughout the week. And so if that would be a next step for you as we kind of take next steps towards recovering from the pandemic and begin to do life together again, I would encourage you to consider and maybe sign up at the Info Center after service today. So Chris is going to be coming up this morning for the message. And uh, as he comes up, I want to just pray over our time. And then after we pray, uh, the K through five kids will be dismissed to go to, to children's ministry. Let's pray together. Father, we do. We lift up the name of Jesus this morning. We thank you that we have truly good news to sing about, to praise about, that we can have life in Christ. And so as uh, Chris comes up and gives us the word this morning, I pray that you would help us to see that connection between what Jesus did at the cross and what, what the message this morning is about and how we can take next steps to live out the life Christ died to make possible for us. We thank you for Chris. Pray your Holy Spirit we just breathe in him and through him this morning. Give us the ears to hear and open hearts to receive the message this morning. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see, good to see everybody today. Uh, I am sitting down today <laughs> as Carrie laughs at me. Uh, it's you know I'm always I always say like when you preach and sitting down, it's because you really you know this one really you preaching to yourself. I'm not really preaching to myself on this one. I'm just old. I got a back. I, so I look like I'm walking like a duck. I've messed up my back, and so I'm going to sit today. If y'all don't care, I'm I'm going to take a seat today and hang out. And I, and I appreciate uh, you know just I appreciate Neil and Todd and Eric praying over me earlier to <laughs> try to get me through this today. But uh, it's been an interesting 
weekend for Valentine's Week. You know what it is? I, may, I, I talked about last week how I didn't like Valentine's Day. So it's Valentine's Day. So, so it came back to bite me, literally. Like I, I said, I was talking about how Valentine's Day was made up and all that. And now I'm paying for it today. So there you go. So you guys see, don't make fun of Valentine's Day. All right. There's my lesson for me. So, uh, but happy Valentine's Day. I'm, I'm just, I'm just messing with everybody. Last, I hope you have a good, uh, a good Valentine's Day. If you're into that kind of stuff. If you're not, I hope you have a, a great Valentine's Day. Anyway, um, I'm not saying anything bad about Valentine's Day ever again. <laughs> Uh, so, but it is Valentine's Day, and, and we're continuing our series today. That this is us series. Uh, we're we're excited about this series in the, the month of love, right? February, the month of love, and, and talking about relationships. And, and really, it is. We're not basing this series on the the popular TV show This Is Us, but it, we, we borrowed the name from it. And and a lot of it has to do with the idea that the the show is centered on relationships. I don't know if you, if you watch it or not. And I I don't watch it per se, but I've watched a little bit of just in preparation for this series, just kind of see what it's about. But, but centers on relationships, right? And relationships between the family, between, you know, couples and and children and all these different things. And, and we talk about the, 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 the dynamics in relationships and the stages of relationships. And that's what this series is about the different stages of the relationships. And, we, and last week we started out, we talked about singleness, right? We, we spent some time talking about singleness. And, and we're going to move through the other stage. We're going to talk about dating. We're going to talk about being engaged. We're going to talk about being married. And at the end, we're going to wrap up and, and sort of talk about our, our us as a church and as a, as a community of believers as a church and so kind of cast some vision there. So, and I said this last week, and I'll say this again. I hope that, that, that you know, don't check out on me. If you're not in that particular stage of relationship, because I'm going to hit you at some point. If I haven't already, I'm going to get you at some point in terms of what stage that you're in. We're, we're going to talk about that particular stage. But what I really want us to emphasize, or what I really want to emphasize, and I try to say this a lot, and the reason I say this a lot is because it's, I think it's important. We all have a ministry, okay? It's not just me. It's not just the people up here on the stage. It's not just leadership of the church. We all have a ministry. And when I say that, I mean we all know people who are at different points in their life. And and when we go through this series, whether you're single or dating or engaged or married, you probably know somebody who's in one of those other stages, okay? And and hopefully we can take take what God has shown us through these things, through his word, and we can take that and we can share that with people who might be in those particular stages. So um, so even if you're not in that stage, I want to encourage you to take what we're talking about and look for ways that you can go out and share that with other folks. Um, and welcome to the folks that are watching us online today, and we hope certainly it's this, and whenever they, you may see this message, that you think of it in, in the same terms. And when we think about the idea that of this is us in terms of the series, we all have an us, don't we? Even if we're single, there's an us, there's a we. There's, and, and even whatever stage of relationship we're in, we've all got an us. There, there's, some, there's some us in there. And, and, and when we think about that, there's a question, and I, brought, I, I proposed this question or posed this question to you last week. There's a question that I think we all should, should think about, and I think I put it in my slides today. Um, is Jesus at the center of your us? Is Jesus at the center of your us? Whatever stage you're in, doesn't matter. Single, dating, engaged, married, doesn't matter what stage you're in. Is Jesus at the center of your us wherever you're at? Too many times I think that we don't have that focus in our us. Too many times I don't think that Jesus is the focus of our us. And so in, in, because of that, because of that, we're lacking something. And we tend to look for something that we're missing. We tend to, there's a hole in our lives, there's a hole in our heart that we're trying to fill with something. And so we're looking for something that if we don't have Jesus at the center of our us. And too many times we get into relationships because of that lack of love, right? Because of that lack of that source, whatever it may be, that, that source of love. We, we get into these relationships, and, and a lot of times, to be honest with you, bad relationships kind of start that way, don't they? Because we're, we're trying to fill something that we don't have, and we're just looking for that source of love, something to fill it up. And, and we, we think that we can be that for somebody else a lot of times. Ben Stewart, who is a, who's the pastor of Passion, uh, Passion City Church in Washington, D.C., the, the, I don't know if you know Passion City in Atlanta with Louis Giglio, but they have, a, they have a church in Washington as well, and Ben Stewart's the pastor there, and he wrote a book that we're kind of basing a lot of our series on, and, and he says it this way in his book, and I thought it's really appropriate. I, I think I got this one up here too. When you have a source of life 
you are a source of life. When you have a source of life, you are a source of life. Now, you can replace the word life with love there if you want to. And you say, when, when you are a source of love, when you have a source of love, you then can become a source of love. But, where, but he goes on to say this, but where there is scarcity, desperation sets in. Where there is scarcity, where we don't have that source of love, we were scarce, when we don't have that ultimate source of love, then desperation begins to set in, Right? And when we get desperate, that's when, that's when the trouble begins. And that's when many times we're trying to fill that void in our life with things that, that aren't going to last, things that aren't what, what we think they are going to be. But here's the good news. God is the inexhaustible source of love. He is an inexhaustible source of love. He never gets tired. He never pauses. He never leaves. And that's the source of love that we can hang on to. That's where we can hang our hats. That's where we can lay our anchor down, is in God's love for us. And then when we have that, when, we, when we're able to say for ourselves, again, back to that question, that Jesus is the center of our us, that God is the center of our us, when we embrace this fact, then we can truly embrace others. I mean, think about that. When we have that source of love, that source of life in our lives, then we can go out and we can be that light, as we've talked about several months ago. We can be that light to others. We can be that source of love to others. But we've got to have that, that source in our lives. And unfortunately, and I said this last week, you know, I, every day in, in, my, in my day job, um, I see students who, who lack a source of love, a, lo- a source of life, and they're just looking for somebody to fill that void, for somebody to, to come in there and fill that. And it's constantly, it's, it's just they look into it for another person. They're looking to another person to be that source. But we can be a source of life to others only, only if we are connected to the ultimate source of life. So with that as our framework, we're going to move on to our second stage today, and that is dating, all right? Date, the dating stage. We talked about singleness. Now we're going to move into the dating stage. And I'm, I'm probably the worst person in the world to, to talk about this because I was a terrible boyfriend. I really was. I, mean, I was a lousy. Yeah, as my attitude about, and don't ask Carrie because she's going to agree. But, but my attitude in, in dating, I mean, towards Valentine Day, probably gives you a good idea what kind of boyfriend I was. I was a lousy boyfriend. For example, I literally, and she'll validate this, I was 45 minutes late for our first date, mine and Carrie's. <laughs> 45 minutes late. For the, she was getting ready to leave, right? I don't know what held her back. But she was getting ready to walk out and probably go out with some other guy. But, you know, somebody better than me. She probably should have. But, but she was getting ready to leave. She's smiling because she's like, yeah, I was. But, um, but, but it's embarrassing to think. That's, that's the kind of boyfriend I was. I was a, I'm just telling you. I'm being honest. Full transparency. This is my testimony, all right? It's a lousy boyfriend. I did, some, I, was in, I did some embarrassing things. I mean, I think back to different relationships that I had when I was dating. And I was like, you're an idiot. Like, how, why did you do? Why did you act like that? Because, and the thing about it is, I never really thought about dating, what dating could be or what dating should be in a lot of ways. Now, now here's the thing. I got way lucky, okay? I got way lucky in, in, in that relationship. God provided someone for me to put up with my lousy boyfriendness, okay, and, and saw through all that lousy stuff. I got lucky on that one. But sometimes, though, it doesn't work out like that, does it? I mean, it doesn't always work out that way. Um, and maybe you're here today and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you're here today and you've, you've been in that experience. And it doesn't work out that, that that relationship ends up, you know, going very well. You know, dating is, dating is hard, right? I mean, I remember what dating is like. I mean, I really do. But, but dating's tough. It's risky. It's risky. People that are in that dating stage, you're opening yourself up to a lot of hurt into a lot of pain. I mean, you're opening yourself up, and, and maybe those of you who are married here, or maybe if you're in that stage where you're engaged and you, you kind of think back to your dating life, I mean, you're really vulnerable at that point, aren't you? I mean, and when we look at people that we know that are in dating relationships, we realize that they are very vulnerable and very open about where they're at. It's tough to date somebody. It really is. And I won't get off on this soapbox, but social media has made it even worse. I mean, I don't know how, and I, you know, deal with kids every day in the high school, and for the youth here today, like, when it comes to dating, get away from social media. Social media makes it so hard to date. Like, one of the most common things, okay, y'all going to laugh at this. Some of y'all adults will laugh at this. Kids will be like, well, yeah, that's true. Why would they do that? One of the biggest things that we have, like, when we have disagreements between kids that could pot- to t- potentially lead to fights was because uh, one boyfriend 
liked some girl's picture on Instagram, and it's not her, his girlfriend. And then the girlfriend finds out about it, right? And then, and then the girls are in the bathroom like, dee, 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 and then I have to run into the girl's bathroom, right? Which is never a good thing, okay? It's never a fun thing, all right? So, so that's, but I mean, that happens all the time. But social media, and again, I'm not going to get off in the soapbox, but that makes it so hard to date these days. There's so much pressure. Like, you got to get just the right selfie. You got to get just the right, you know, picture with the, the hearts and the sun or whatever. What's that commercial? Y'all remember that? I mean, you got to get just the right stuff. There's so much pressure. You got to update your relationship status, whatever it is. But it's just so difficult to date and people throw themselves out and, and lay their hearts on lines. So let me give you something. Let me, let me, last week I told you that singleness was a gift and y'all looked at me like I was crazy. You know, that, so I tried to blow your mind with that one. So let me give you another statement today about dating that, that maybe kind of flips the script a little bit, maybe makes you think about dating a little differently. And it's this. Dating is about evaluation. Dating is about evaluation. When you're dating, we're always evaluating the other person. You're always evaluating that other person. I mean, think about it. Do I like this person? Do I not like this person? Is this somebody I can see myself spending my life with, or is this somebody that I can't even see myself finishing the dinner with, right? I mean, you know, all of us, if you've dated much, you've probably been in both those situations. And, you know, oh, gosh, I got to call. I got to go. Emergency. You know, I got to, sorry. Uh, you pay. I'll leave. Um, but, you know, you've been in those situations. And so you're constantly evaluating those, that person that you're dating. And it is an evaluative process. And we talk about this from a biblical standpoint, but you know what? Here's an interesting thing. You know, the Bible doesn't mention dating. The Bible doesn't mention dating. There's no verses about dating in the Bible, right? There's, there's no, dating is a, is a stage of relationship that we as humans created. It's not in the Bible. There's nothing, there's no like single dating engaged marriage. There's nothing in the Bible about dating. But the Bible has a lot to say about evaluating. The Bible has a lot to say about evaluating other people for different roles. The Bible has a lot to say about evaluating the type of person that you want to be around just in terms of who you hang out with, but also in terms of who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And this, this evaluative, these evaluative verses help us to understand the dating process, even though dating isn't mentioned in the Bible. But to do that, we have to sort of flip the script a little bit and realize that dating is about evaluation. Let me give you an example from Proverbs. And I got two here, so ladies, don't get mad. The first one's for the guys, second one's for the ladies. It's Valentine's Day, we'll be fair. But in terms of evaluating people that you're hanging out with. So in Proverbs 25, verse 24, read this. Better to live on the, a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Now think about that. Everybody laughs. Oh, can, I, can I get on the corner? Of my, you got to get amen. I got a couple of guys are like, amen. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, don't worry, ladies. I'm going to get back to you in a minute. But, but the point in this is, like, who you're spending your time with. You know, it's better to, and the roofs were flat, you know, in this particular time when, the, when, when those were in, and thinking, all right, go, go sit on the corner of the roof and hang out rather than be inside the house. Because the, the quarrelsome part being, there's tension in the house, right? They're creating tension in the house. But then some people, right, and, and, and some people, it, it's, it, you talk about the ladies, let's talk about the guys. Some people look at guys and say, well, do I want to be with this guy because of, uh, you know, can he control himself? Is he, is he, you know, is he very calm? In verse 28, right on down from there, and this is specifically for you ladies, for talking about the guys, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. So in both of these instances, right, and you think of the guys, is he a hothead? Does he get mad about little things? Is it somebody that, you know, is somebody that I can really deal with and talk to on a normal, on a, have normal conversations? And so, these verses specifically lead to evaluation. How do we evaluate the people that we're hanging out with? It doesn't say anything about dating, but it talks about the people that we're spending time with. So, so we look at this, and we think about dating in terms of evaluation. I think it kind of leads us to two questions. We have a who question, and we have a how question. Okay? We have a who question and a how question. Being, the who question is this. What qualities should I look for in that person that I'm dating? What are the characteristics? What are the qualities that I want to look for? And the how question is, what process should I go through in the dating life? What is the process of dating? So you have a who and a how. We're going to talk about both of those for just a few minutes here, uh, if you'll permit me. The first one is the who, okay? The who. Let me tell you, let me, let me start this one out about, by talking to you about who maybe we shouldn't be dating or who we shouldn't be thinking about dating. 
You ever seen Jerry Maguire? You ever seen Jerry Maguire? You ever seen that movie? Because it's not going to make any sense for a lot of you haven't seen it. I was thinking about doing a, a video clip, but I don't know if that's legal, and I probably would uh, get us in trouble, uh, but didn't even know how to do that. But anyway, um, there's, this, there's this real famous scene in the movie Jerry Maguire. It's got Tom Cruise and Renee Zellweger, and he's a sports agent, and they have a relationship, and they kind of broke up, and, and he comes back. Some of y'all may be thinking, oh, yeah, I kind of remember that. And so Renee Zellweger's character, who I can't remember her name. I know Tom Cruise's name because it's the name of the movie. But, um, but she's having this, like, We Hate Men Club meeting at her house with all these ladies that are talking about how bad men are and, and all this. And Tom Cruise comes rushing through the door, right? And he gives this big speech and talking about how much he loves her and, and all of this. It's when she says, maybe y'all have heard this, she makes the, there's two famous lines in, that, in this big monologue. One is she says, you had me at hello. You guys, anybody remember that? Okay, it made no sense that people haven't seen it, so I won't try to imitate it again. But, but in his monologue, he, he makes this statement. He says, you complete me. And when talking about his love for her, he's like, you complete me. Now, I'm not trying to down the movie or, or ruin it for you if you haven't seen it, but here's the thing. We shouldn't be looking for somebody to complete us, okay? When we're talking about who in the characteristics of dating somebody, we shouldn't be looking for that person. to. You know, it was a wonderful movie. It was very romantic. I even liked it, all right? I didn't cry, but I liked it. But what he said, and I get what he was saying, so I'm not, I'm not you know, trying to destroy the movie for you, but we shouldn't be looking for a person to complete us. And here's the reason. That's too much for a human to bear, okay? That's too much for a finite, sinful human to deal with. When no human can meet the standard of completing us, okay? No human being on this earth can meet the standard of completing who you are. And if that's who we're looking for, what happens is we develop a consumer mentality in the dating world. And parents, this is something we can really talk to our children about as we get older, as they get older and get into the dating world. You develop a consumer mentality. What I mean by that is you want to date like you go to Burger King, Okay, and have your burger your way, you say, well, I want somebody that's tall. I want somebody that's handsome. I want somebody that's, you know, got, you know, this color hair, this color eyes, or somebody that's friendly or athletic or blah, blah, blah. Somebody that loves books. When we start putting our customized order together, that becomes a consumer mentality. And eventually we're always going to be disappointed because we're basing a permanent decision, i.e. marriage, we're basing a permanent decision on a temporary characteristic, a temporary quality, right? We're, bar- we're basing the permanent on the transient. We all change, right? I mean, look at me. I'm sitting in a chair because my back's tore up. Because, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't have back problems, right? We all change. I mean, that, that's a simple example. But, but all of us, all of our, our who we are is going to change. And many times, relationships get started based on characteristics that will eventually change, Look at verse, but let me show this verse to you. Verse, uh, Proverbs 31, verse 30. It says this. The Bible, again, back to the evaluation piece. It says this. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. You see, characteristics change. When we go up to the drive-in dating window and place our order, we might get it then, but 20 years from now, that order is going to look different. That person is going to be different. I would submit to some of us that are adults, I don't think the kids may have got there yet, but as us as adults, if we look back at different stages in our lives, our personalities were probably different, our interests were different, our goals were different, the way we look is different, right? We all look differently. I mean, things change. And so, so beauty is fleeting. All those things, our, our whole personalities change as time goes on. So we don't necessarily look for somebody that completes us, but, but what do we want to look for? Well, I would submit that there's two things. Character before God and chemistry with each other. Character before God and chemistry with other. I think we should look for someone who has the same purpose that we do. And hopefully our purpose is we're working toward a relationship with God, right? We as individuals are working for a relationship with God. And again, parents, we're talking to our kids, and I know a lot of us here have kids who are getting older. It's like I mean, kids start dating at an early age now, all right, and going through middle school, high school, and all the time. When we talk to our kids about who they're dating, what is it that that other person is working for? What is it that they're trying to get to? What are we trying to get to in our lives? Are we working toward a relationship with God? Ben Stewart, in his book, he puts it this way, allegiance determines 
direction. Allegiance determines direction. Our purpose is going to determine the direction that we're going in in our lives. And that's true for any of us. Like whatever stage we're at, the married couple's in the house today. It, it, that, that's true for all of us. Our allegiance determines the direction that we are going in our lives. In 2 Corinthians, we read this. Do not, this is a farming reference, which I don't know much about because I'm not a farmer, but I think you guys will get it. Um, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Now, the farming reference is the yoke. Like, animals were yoked together. There's a big contraption that they would put on them to pull, you know, plow ground and things like that. There's, there's actually instructions about, about farming in Deuteronomy 22. It says this, Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Meaning the ox and the donkey are two different animals, have two different goals, two different ideas, two different strengths. They go at different paces when they move, right? And it's the same thing with us, with people. We don't be yoked together with unbelievers. If you're pursuing a relationship with God and then you're going to jump into a human relationship with someone who's going in a different direction... That's a recipe for disaster. That's trouble. When we yoke ourselves to someone who wants to go in a, a different direction, it simply doesn't work out. There's two outcomes generally when this happens. One is one of the people in the relationship will give in to the other. And, and unfortunately, many times, it's the believer that gives in. It truly is. Many times it's the believer that gives in because they feel like they found this person that completes them and they don't want to lose that person. They think, well, okay, all right, well, we won't go to church as much or we won't be involved in church or maybe, you know, whatever it may be. And they tend to, to lower, we tend to lower our expectations and our standards and so we give in. The other outcome is that both parties will be stubborn and things will fall apart. So we have to be very careful who we're, how, when we evaluate people, what is their purpose? What are they moving toward? Are we, as individuals, are we working in a relationship to God, and do we trust God to put someone in our life who has the same purpose? Because that's an everlasting quality. Right? That's something that, that will stay with us. And I would take it a step further. And, 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 and if we look at the psalm, in Psalm 1, we see this, and it talks about, I think, not just dating a believer, but dating a pursuer of God. Okay? Not just dating somebody who says, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, okay, yeah, we'll go to church big deal. That's, that's cool. I can do that. But are you, are you spending time with someone who is pursuing God? In Psalm 1, we read this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. And then it says this, verse 2. But whose delight, that person whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That's somebody that's pursuing God. Right? And then what's the result of that? Verse 3 says this. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. And in this last part, whatever they do prospers. Wouldn't that be somebody that's nice to be around? I mean, just in general in life, right? Wouldn't they have somebody that's just nice to be around? Somebody who is firm. The tree imagery here, someone who is planted. Trees don't move, do they? They get blown in the wind, but tree, unless they get blown over by a tornado, trees are planted. The roots are deep. They're strong. That's the kind of person that I think we want to be around. Someone who is not just a believer, but somebody who is a pursuer of God. So if you're, link, if you're, if you're out there, if you're in a dating relationship, and these are conversations that you can have, if you're, if you're single and you're thinking about moving into a dating relationship, this is that conversation that you can have as well. And when I look for someone going forward. So we talked about character. So, so real quick, I just wanted to mention the chemistry part. You know, when you think about chemistry, I mean, that's, Pretty simple, I think, and pretty self-explanatory. Do you really like hanging out with each other? Are conversations easy with one another when you're in that dating relationship? And, and here's the thing about chemistry. When we pursue the person with the character that we're talking about, when we're pursuing a person whose character is pursuing God and we're both moving in the same direction, the chemistry is easy. The chemistry is easy. God's in that relationship, and the chemistry will be easy. It'll come natural. So that's the first question, uh, the, the who question. Let's talk about the how question for just a second. 
uh, as we get closer to wrapping up here. I'm, I'm not spending as much time on this one, but, but let's talk about the how question. How to date. What's the process? You know, what is dating? Again, the Bible doesn't, doesn't mention dating. This is something that we as humans have made up. But it gives us a lot of instruction in terms of the evaluating and then how we can live in relationship with one another. The first one, the, the first piece of that dating process that I would submit to you is prayer. We want to be in a, in a prayerful relationship, right? We need to pause in that dating process and we need to acknowledge God in that process. We need to allow his truths to become evident in that dating relationship. So we should date in a prayerful way. We pray Pray together with the person that you're dating. I mean, let's pray together. Let's pray that we work together and allow God into our relationship and allow his truths to become evident in that relationship. The, the second step in that process, I would say, would be to, to have autonomy in the relationship. Because, again, dating is something that doesn't allow for a lot of autonomy, does it? Right? We look at it as a state of being and not a process. And what we've been talking about this morning, again, kind of flipping the script a little bit, is about dating is more of a process than a state of being. When we get on Facebook and we change our relationship status to say an in a relationship, I don't even know what that stuff, I don't even know how to do that. I just hear people talk about it or whatever, your Instagram status or whatever status that you may have. But we begin to put labels on the process, right? And when we start putting labels on things, then there become problems. The autonomy kind of goes away. Like, you know, you get into a relationship and, and you haven't talked for a day. And then the one, one person in the relationship says, why didn't you call me last night? I was watching TV and I went to bed. I didn't need to call you. And then it becomes a tension, right? Or why didn't you text me back? Or as I'm told, and kids, y'all understand this, why'd you leave me on red? Right? Does that, does that make sense? Does anybody No, You guys, does anybody understand that? I, I've heard that forever. I don't know. They left me on red. Okay, what does that mean? I, I don't know. So I say that. So I'm assuming that the kids in the audience will, will know what I'm talking about. But then it becomes an issue. You left me on red. We're supposed to be boyfriend and girlfriend. Why did you not respond to me? Why did you not get back to me? Why did it take you an hour to text me back? All right? And, and that's where that autonomy gets in. And so when we, when we look at dating as a state of being, like this is a place we are at, rather than a process that we are going through, then the autonomy goes away. Another part of the dating process that I would submit to us is purity. And parents, this is something that we've got to spend a lot of time talking with our kids about because, because purity in this world is extremely difficult. Now, I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to get too deep into that today for obvious reasons, but that's another message. But it is a very important piece of that message. And I would submit if you're in a relationship, you know, when, when the purity piece breaks down, emotional attachments become evident, and those things cause real problems. People get attached in ways that, that are very, very difficult to battle and to fight. And I would say, and as a parent myself, I mean, those are conversations that, that we've had, and I would suggest, parents, that we, we have those conversations because everything we see on the media, in the news, and social media, on commercials and movies, everything that we see doesn't value purity at all. And when purity is taken out of relationships, relationships have problems. There's no getting around it. You can't deny it, and you can't, Beat it. Those emotional attachments, and I see it younger and younger and younger with kids in our schools. And the emotional scars are real. They don't go away that easy. The next way I would say is graciously. We should date graciously. Remember that that other person is a child of God. Whoever you're in a relationship with, they're a child of God. How are you treating them? I mean, I probably need to put like copy and paste that one for the marriage one, <laughs> right? I mean, and I may say I mean, may use that in the marriage one too for the married couples in the house. But but they that person that you're in that relationship with, they're a child of God. How are you treating them? Are you treating them as a child of God? And the last thing I would say about the process of dating is be patient. Be patient. You know, we don't have to rush through this stuff, right? We had to, I mean, people get so wrapped. I mean, you get, I mean, I remember, you know, how the puppy love and you get excited, you're first dating somebody, ooh, you're so excited. And you, and you make these emotional decisions on short term relationships that have long term consequences, and you don't necessarily know that person. There's a couple of verses about that Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy, and he's talking about leadership, but I think it, it connects to this idea of being patient in a dating relationship. He says this. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Then two verses later, he says this. 
the sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them, the sins of others trail behind it. And what he's saying, he's talking about leadership. Be careful that you don't get some, you see somebody and you think, oh, they'd be a great leader. Let's, let's, let's make them a leader right now. Let's get them going. He's saying, wait, let's kind of get to know them a little bit better and see where things are. Same thing in a dating relationship. You may get into that relationship and two months in, you're thinking, this is great. They're wonderful. They're awesome. And you're seeing, because you guys remember, like, you know, when, when, I, when Karen and I first started dating, like, I always opened the car door for her, right? You know? I mean, didn't I? I think so. I opened the car door. I should do better at that now. I know I'm terrible. But, but you know, I opened the car door for her. I'm opening doors. I'm always dressed up when we're going out. You know, now, you know, then eight months into a relationship, it's like, can we just wear sweats tonight? Like, I mean, I know we're going to Longhorn, but can I just throw some sweats and a sweatshirt on? <laughs> you know, we're going to the movies. It's like, you know, so, but, but as time goes by, you get to know each other a little bit better, and you see the warts, and you see the negative sides, and, and you see all these things. Like, everything's all bubbly and happy and funny at the beginning, but then when you start to see this person, so, so that idea of being patient and again, he's talking about leadership, but in a relationship at standpoint, you, you connect it to they're all everything's wonderful at the beginning, but let's take our time and see what this looks like four months, six months, eight months down the road. Now, I, there's listen, I'm not putting any timetable on like dating. I don't know how long you should date. That's something you've got to figure out. But patience is a huge part of what it is, getting to know those people. So there, there's the how. Just some ideas, okay? Uh, and, and I'm not Dr. Phil, okay, so I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't have all the answers, but the Bible does, right? The Bible does. And, and, and everything that we've looked at today is, is nothing, again, the Bible doesn't mention dating, but it has a lot to do to talk about evaluation and how we deal with people. So I would submit to us that, that the scripture is where we go for our advice, not Dear Abby, or not that there's anything wrong Dear Abby, it's wonderful, but it's fine, but, you know, or Dr. Phil or any of those places. The scripture, if you're looking for Advice in relationships, the scripture is the place to go. Prayer is the way to go. So ultimately we need to ask, as I begin to wrap this up, and as the band, you guys can start rolling back up this way. We need to ask ourselves this question again about our dating relationships. Is Jesus at the center of our us? If you're in a dating relationship right now, that's a, that's a question that you can ask. If you know somebody that's in a dating relationship right now, can you ask yourself, if you're, if you're contemplating getting in a dating relationship at some point, is Jesus at the center of our us? I mean, it sounds pretty simple, but in today's world, it is very, very difficult because the biblical view of relationships is not what we see in the cultural view of relationships. Many times we think if we don't have a relationship that, you know, people say, well, you know, is there something wrong or they, you know, whatever it is. But remember, singleness is a gift. Singleness is a gift. And dating is not a state of being. It's part of a process. It's part of evaluation. Our bottom line today is this. Evaluate our dating relationships in light of God's purpose for our lives. Let's evaluate our dating relationships in light of God's purpose for our lives. And, and I would submit to you this, and, and again, the next steps are going to be different for everybody at the different points of where you are. But if you're in a dating relationship, I would say, ask that question. Is Jesus at the center of our us? And if you know someone that's in a dating relationship, I would just encourage you, as I said to begin, and I will say this a lot because I just, this is something I don't, I, I, I'm going to try to find a way, I probably will say this every week in every sermon, every series, or try to. We all have a ministry. We all have a ministry. We all have relationships. We all have an opportunity to speak to somebody. So if you know somebody that's in a dating relationship or contemplating being in a dating relationship, I would just ask you to, to share that question with that person. Is Jesus at the center of our us? Let's pray. God, thank you um, for your word. Uh, thank you for uh, your son. Thank you for being a God of grace and of mercy and of love. And Lord, I know that, that, that uh, there's a lot of people out there that are in different stages. And this dating stage, Lord, it is, it is so tough today. It is so tough in this culture and in this world and all the different things that we see. It's hard to know who to date. It's hard to know how to date. It's hard to, to go against what is popular and what is seen. But Lord, I would just pray for people that are in that, in that stage that, that, that you would open their hearts to understand that you need to be at the center of that relationship. That you need to be a part of everything that we do, including our dating relationships. 
And I would just pray for those people who are in those spots that they would work to put you right that center, that, that, they, that both parties in that relationship would become pursuers of you through that relationship, and you will, you will bless each of them individually. So, God, as we go forward, for those of us that are not in that stage, Lord, I just pray that, that if we, we have those opportunities to speak in people's lives, that you would give us the words, give us the courage, give us the strength to do that. Help us to pray for those opportunities because if we've been there and done that. We can, we can help people move in the right direction. But ultimately, God, just, I just pray that you would help all of us seek you, help all of us to grow in that relationship with you. Just thank you. I praise you. Thank you for sending your son to die for our sins, to give us a grace that, that we can't earn and we will never deserve, but you gave it freely through your son. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.
of our hope, all of our hope in, all of our trust in, all of our future in, the God that never fails, all of our faith in, all of our strength in, all of our future in, the God that never fails. All of our hope, all of our hope in, all of our trust in, all of our future in, the God that never fails, all of our faith in, all of our strength in, all of our future in, the God that
just so thankful this morning that our hope is in you and we have that hope in Jesus. Uh, So God, we're just so thankful this morning that we had the opportunity to come together and to worship and lift up your name. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you be with us as we leave this place, that you would remind us that our first and foremost responsibility is to seek after you. Uh, So God, we pray that we would do that first, that we would seek out that relationship that Chris talked about with you, uh, to put you first in our lives and no one else. Lord, we just pray that you be with us as we navigate those relationships wherever we are, whether we're single, whether we're dating, whether we're engaged or married. uh, God, that in all those situations that we would put you first. And Lord, knowing that, we know as as we put you first uh, that our relationships will prosper. The things around us will prosper when we're putting you first, when we're putting the kingdom first and our relationship with you first. So we just pray for all of us, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, that you would make that uh, a reality for us. You would make that something that we not only know to be true, uh, but that we believe to be true and that it would resonate in our hearts and that people around us uh, could see that. So we just thank you, Lord, for who you are and for the opportunity to worship you in this place. We pray that as we leave that your name would continue to be on our lips. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Well, hey, thank you all so much for coming and worshiping with us. I just want to leave you with the, the question that Chris left us with. Is Jesus at the center? I remember a quote that he said, let, let your heart be so connected, so buried in Christ that someone else will have to go through him before they ever connect to you. So where do you go from here? What's your next step? And how can we walk with you? How can we walk together in that growing relationship with Jesus? Y'all are dismissed. If you have kids in children's ministry, please be sure to come and get them. Y'all have a great day.